So that's been a learning curve as well. And that's how the music industry is. You know, it's not a necessity. It's rather cutthroat because it is purely entertainment for folks. So that's been super valuable, just learning the different types of selling different products and different services. You know, a lot of the folks in the office who, mind you, are all at least, you know, 15, 20 years older than I am, um, their experience had been in product selling, which is a completely different type of sale. So it's been really interesting to learn how each industry approaches sales and how they can be continued, you know, continuously developed and, and improved as well. And I think that that's really put me on the fast track towards the music industry more than I would have expected even when I first started at the job. Welcome to the show. Don't forget to tell your friends. We've got a wonderful guest on today who has a strange path to her ultimate goal, and she's going to get into lateral movement and how most people might be following the strange path she's on. We're going to get into combining your passion with success, not the normal way, even if they're different, because her passion and her success are totally different. And we're going to get into the benefits of big challenges and how they create opportunity to reflect, reform, and focus on your goals. Welcome to the show. Hit the subscribe button. Welcome to the Edge of Excellence. Well, Grace Jones, it's been such a long time. Last time I saw you, you lived in Illinois. Now you live in Indiana. You were working with me. Now you're on this path to greatness. Welcome to the show, and thank you for making time for the Edge of Excellence. Yeah, thank you so much for having me. I was so excited to to be reached out to, and I'm very happy to be here. Well, we reach out to people that are crushing it, and we're going to get into how you're crushing it, why you're crushing it. But before we get into graduating on time with a great degree and plenty of experience, before we talk about starting life in a managerial role, before we get into choosing a path, and it's kind of a strange path, to achieve your dream of becoming a leader in business, I got to ask you what I ask everybody. What is your definition of excellence? Yeah, I would say that my definition of excellence is doing something that you are passionate about that also benefits others. I think that that is extremely important just to keep in mind, you know, because you can be really great at something, but it doesn't really pay off. There's no point to it. You're not caring about it very much. Nobody else cares about it. Um, It's really important to make sure that you are passionate about what you're doing well and that other people benefit from what you're doing well as well. So do you think someone can be excellent at something that doesn't benefit others? And I was thinking of all these horrible historical figures that I can't say and what they were excellent at, but can you be excellent and not benefit others? Or is it the fact that you're benefiting others? That's what makes it excellent. I wouldn't like to use the word excellence. You know, I can say success, maybe. I know plenty of people that I would describe as successful. They've got all the money and all the cars and all the fame, but, you know, are they truly making the world a better place? I don't think so. I wouldn't necessarily describe them as excellence. I think that's a special adjective in and of itself. Okay. So excellence means you're impacting the world in a positive Mm -hmm. way. So it goes beyond. Okay, that's pretty interesting. All right, well, we're going to go back in time, and for you, not too far back, (laughs) but before you graduated from the Kelly School of Business at Indiana University, go Hoosiers. Go Hoosiers. (laughs) Before you got a bunch of awards and you served as president of IU's Club Sports Federation, I remember when you were doing that while you were working, while you were going to school, while you were having multiple surgeries too, yep. <laughs> all at the same time, before that happens, before you became plump, before you started plummeting up the career path towards your big goal, what were you like in high school? And I kind of know this. I kind of remember this <laughs> from back in the day. What was life like? I know you played basketball. You were into everything, weren't you? Yeah, I kind of dabbled in a little bit of everything. I I was very different back in high school than I am now. I was much more shy and kept to myself quite a bit, but I kind of did a little bit of everything. I I was a varsity athlete um, on the basketball team, on the track team. Then I was also a band kid. I played flute and piccolo and sang in the jazz band and then the choir um, between, you know, AP classes during the day. So 
I was kind of everywhere. And in my high school, that was odd. Um, I think a lot of times students at my high school, they kind of picked a lane and stuck to it. So I was kind of an outlier there. So I didn't quite fit into any one category, but that was okay because I, you know, that was who I was. So were you a goth metalhead too? Because you've got <laughs> sports, you've got flute and piccolo, you've got AP, you're missing the goth metalhead, punk rock yeah, band. Not quite there with, with the red hair. I could have maybe pulled something off, but not quite, not in my Catholic school uniform. I don't think so. <laughs> but weren't you a singer too? Why do I think you were a singer? Yeah, yeah, I did. I, I sang for the jazz choir, oh, okay. for the jazz combo, and then also choir. Yeah, jazz um, was a whole special part of my life. Very niche, I would say, but very cool aspect. So you were what we would call well-rounded. Um, have, you ever, have you heard that Taylor Swift song, I'm the Man? I have, yes. <laughs> okay, that's one of my favorite songs because it's a, a, it's a true story. And if you're <laughs> listening right now and you haven't heard the Taylor Swift song, I'm a Man, she does a pretty good job of documenting how the world is. So if you were a man, you would be called a Renaissance man, right? So you're a Renaissance woman. And shout out again to Taylor Swift on that song, which I think is like a documentary of the world. And we'll just sum it up mm -hmm. real quick. You know, she makes a bunch of money. She crushes it in business and people are heckling her and coming up with crazy conspiracies about her and knocking her off her pedestal. But if she was a man, she'd be the man. Mm -hmm. And maybe she had a couple of relationships and people use bad words towards women that have had a couple of relationships. But if you're a man, you're a player. And yeah. she goes into this in the lyrics. And the only reason I know is because I was watching that Taylor Swift concert. My daughter and her friend were here and they were playing it upstairs. And they always have the subtitles on because people that are 18 or 19 always have the subtitles on. And I got to see all the lyrics and I'm like, this is the song. Mm -hmm. She is the yeah. woman and this is the song. So you are a Renaissance woman. <laughs> uh, from way back when and you were doing this variety of things you weren't painting though you need to add painting to your I know, uh, not other than music it was not very artistic <laughs> yeah you need to add painting then you're fully in the renaissance and you're doing all these different things in high school you said ap so you must have been getting good grades yeah that definitely came from my parents there just was no other option so i had to you know be really good at Time management, that's for sure, doing all the extracurriculars while getting top-notch grades. But I'm happy I did. It paid off. <laughs> did, didn't you work, too? I did, yeah. I oh, worked, that, I you know, I you can't do that. That's I impossible. Like I got to throw a flag. That's impossible. You can't do AP <laughs> and sports and band and work. That's what parents think. Don't let uh -huh. my kid work that hard. But you did that, too. And a few jobs, right? Yeah. So I, well, I volunteered, which ended up turning into a job eventually um, at a therapeutic writing center where I helped teach special needs students how to ride horses. And it was basically like therapy for them. So that was a super cool experience. I was sad to move away and I couldn't participate there anymore. But, and then I was also the manager of a Cold Stone Creamery in Hills, too. Illinois. So that was a good time. That was quite the leadership and management experience for a 16 year old. That was actually really, really beneficial and super fun. Wow. Shout out to Doug Ducey. And I know you know this. <laughs> I do. Became the governor of Arizona. I told you. He was an EO member and in forum with my mm -hmm. friend Brandon Ains and sold that business and became governor. And he's done a pretty good job or the new company, the new owners have done a good job with yeah. teaching people work ethic. So shout out to Cold Stone Creamery. Love and then Cold also- Stone. You got all your passions all combined in high school and you're getting good grades and you're making money, which enabled you to get accepted to um, the Wiley Farm University of Indiana, which is a wonderful, wonderful place. Those of you that are thinking about college, check out Indiana. What'd you say? Kelly School of Business. Oh, but it's on the <laughs> Wiley Farm. Remember the Wiley what? Farm? Yeah, that was my great grandfather's farm. No way. I didn't tell you that. You never heard of Wiley Hall? That's named after your great grandfather? Yeah, it's a little known oh fact. My God. It was their farm and they donated it to the university so they could build the university on it. And I've that never so been cool. there. You didn't know this, but my when my no. daughter and son were applying to college, my dad let this my dad still like I have nothing to do with it. I didn't even know. They told me later <laughs> in life. But somehow, somehow we started getting the flags in the mail. Yeah, oh, Wiley is Hall. So cool. Isn't Wiley yeah, Hall like the student center? 
Yeah, or, or I think it used to be, and then they built a new one, but now it's still there, though. I know, they I built know. a new one. See, that's I, what I, happens. You donate something, and 100 years later, they take it away. Um, but you're at, I thought you knew that. Yeah. I don't tell too many people. I, I, I brag too much about random shit my kids tell me, so I keep that off the list. Um, but you're at the Kelly School of Business at Indiana University, yeah. and Indiana University is super fun. You got the full college campus experience. It's kind of out of the way of everybody else, so you're living on this wonderful island like I did in Santa Barbara of just people between 18 and 22 or 23, well-respected. So it's hard to get into. And as those schools are in the Midwest, those big public schools, you, a little bit easier to get in than to get into the business school as well. And so there's all that stress of getting into business school. But because you've done all this stuff in high school, you slid right in there. So it's hard to get into the school. It's really hard to get into the business school. You were directly admitted in because of all the stuff you did in high school? Yeah, yeah, which was kind of a surprise, actually, because I didn't actually apply to be a direct admit. Um, I wasn't originally planning on going to IU, and so it was almost a last-minute decision to apply, um, and they just gave it to me anyway, which was super cool, um, and I got a special letter that they don't do that very often, so that was quite a pat on the back for all my high school, high school accomplishments. So at 18 years old, you get this written, uh, <laughs> written evidence that working hard, being balanced, juggling all these plates is actually a pretty good idea. And since I knew you in college, it really set into your personality, or maybe it was already there. I don't know if it backed it up and kept you going, but you've always been this kind of multiple focused juggler and able to achieve in all. So you don't just do well in school, and then you came and worked at College Works and did really well at College Works, and you're spinning that plate. But you still had um, the being in charge of the club sports and you're spinning that place. I think you had your own club team that you were the president mm -hmm. of and you're spinning that plate. And you've got all these plates spinning um, that you were spinning. You kind of held all those sticks. And those that aren't watching, I'm making really wonderful arm gestures. If you're just listening, it's pretty cool. And you're spinning those plates and then you get into college and you keep spinning the plates. Are you still spinning yeah. all the plates? Yeah, it kind of feels like I am. <laughs> but it's you know, just kind of a way of life. And it's the new norm. You know, I, I don't think I've ever not been like that. So I couldn't imagine myself being just single faceted. So you might swap the plates out and mm -hmm. change from one plate, but put another one on there. But you kind of thrive by having a few things going on at once. So you you yeah. like the balance. I do. And it keeps me focused on each thing. It forces me to be efficient and organized because I don't really have another choice. <laughs> yeah, I think a lot of people, when they have one plate spinning, they're just doing the school thing. Mm -hmm. It's not that hard to spin the one plate. So they wander off and they forget about spinning it and it falls down. Right. And I'm like you, I need to have a few things going because I know it's like, okay, I got to stay focused all day and get it done because I've got a bunch of things going on. And when I have too much free time, I just don't focus on the plates at all. Yeah, yeah, that's exactly right. And I, 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 I mean, I don't even really remember a time. Maybe I had one summer after I graduated high school where all I did was have a job because I no longer had sports. I no longer had my high school curriculum. I'm like, <laughs> oh, this is crazy. I have all this free time. I only have a job, you know. That summer, uh, you know, got most of my fun time out of the way before I got to college. Hey, for I'm thumping my microphone. If you're listening, Jake Stewart, there's no such thing as a summer off. I thought you were going to say I had one summer where I didn't do anything. No, one summer where I only had a job. And and my son, bless his soul, he's like, I need to have that. What did he call it? He had a name for it, too. Like a relax summer or a oh, uh -huh. sum, summer break after college. I'm like, that doesn't exist, dude. Those are for people that don't have a job. You get a job and you start right away. So yep. your, your break was just having a summer job yeah. and not having <laughs> band and choir and AP and practice and mm -hmm. a job. Yeah, okay. Exactly. So you carry all these spinning plates into college. And did, before you got into college, did you see your path? Did you see your path to the music business or did you have no idea? Yeah, I knew that I wanted to get a music minor at the very least. Um, so I had been studying music for so long. I was like, well, shoot, I might as well just get a piece of paper for it. Um, <laughs> so that's kind of how I decided on getting the music minor. Um, and then as I went through my business, you know, academic courses, I was like, 
oh, well, I could just do both. I can do business and music eventually. So um, it kind of developed as I went through college, um, but I was really happy that I started on that music theory minor track just to kind of get my foot in the door a little bit there. So you started to realize 18, 19, 20, that I can be professional at what I'm passionate about. Exactly, yeah. But you weren't thinking being a professional flute player or a professional singer or a professional no. piccoloist, right? <laughs> no, no, I, do, I don't think, although I love to perform and I, I've enjoyed that, I actually was part of the IU all-campus ensemble and, and played instruments in, in that band for a couple of years, which was super fun. Um, but I just didn't really see being a performer as a career that kind of aligned with, you know, what I wanted to do. That is quite the life, um, being a performer as your career. So yeah, finding that blend between what I knew I was really good at, which was business and what I enjoyed doing, which was music, there is a middle road there. So it's been fun to kind of figure out how to get on that path. So you figured out how to combine your passion with your successes. Mm -hmm. And and that formed into, I'm going to be in the music business. Yes. And you and you want to go into the music, the business of music, right? Yeah. Yeah. And so you're in college and the end goal is becoming the music of business. But if you're listening right now, that's not what she does. <laughs> She's not in the music of business. And I, and I talk in the, in this podcast a lot about how, you, you, your path is like a tree trunk. It's like mm -hmm. a tree and you're on the trunk and then a branch opens up and you go down the branch and then another branch opens up and you keep having all these little multiple paths. And I was talking to my goddaughter and she wants to go into medical device sales mm -hmm. and she's getting some good experience, but you don't go from college into medical device sales. Even if you have a bunch of sales experience, even if you right. went to college works, which my wife did, she still had to have an intermediate job before she went into pharmaceutical sales. And you kind of saw that early. You want to go in the music business. They're not going to make you a record producer or a executive of Columbia Records right, right out of college. Um, there's different paths. And one path might be sweeping the floors at Columbia Music, uh, but be. other paths are transitioning in from the side. So you mm -hmm. went... You had all these passions and you kind of have a weird path that you're still on of getting to the music business. So tell us what was happening in college that pushed you on that path. Yeah. Um, well, even at the very beginning of college, my freshman year, you know, I knew I was going to be a marketing major, which is actually the degree I ended up getting. I never would have expected myself to end up in sales, um, which is what I'm currently doing. But really it was a college works internship that, led me, hey, like, I'm actually really good at this. And, you know, there's a lot of benefits to come out from working in the sales industry. So I learned that, you know, this is something that I can really flourish at, as well as the management aspect of, of running your own business. And coupled with the leadership opportunities that I did have in college as well, I was like, okay, so this is really forming together. I can work myself into, you know, an upper level management type position very quickly post college and that this is something that is very achievable regardless of the industry. Because basically if you're proficient in a field, you can find yourself in any industry at any time. So that's what's exciting about it. Okay. So you wanted to get leadership experience and you're working in the clubs as a leader. And you were probably a leader in high school on the teams. I think you were a team captain, as I recall. Mm -hmm. You wanted to take that leadership experience and add management experience to it. So you did this weird painting thing. You probably <laughs> didn't really, I mean, I know you did a good job with your crews and with your production, but it probably wasn't a dream of yours to make houses look nicer or definitely to market door to door, which you had to do. Yeah or take all the rejection that you had to take. So it was a means to an end. Right. And you gain this management experience and leadership experience. And then you bailed on us, which I still remember as a horrible day, which <laughs> happens quite a bit. You had your surgeries coming up and we'll just mm -hmm. mention that you had like four major hip surgeries, yeah. hard to be <laughs> wandering around doing bids and marketing with Climbing major hip ladders. surgery. <laughs> Climbing ladders, yeah. yeah. That's pr pretty difficult when you had surgery. 
And so you decided, okay, I got to go a different path. And now, was it straight into back nine? Yeah, pretty much. So my senior year of college was the first year yeah, that I didn't do college work um, and just kind of really put all of my efforts into leaving Club Sports Federation at IU, a good place because I had been the president for two years. So I wanted to make sure that they were being handed something that was very functional. Um, same with my own personal team, um, the Western Equestrian team. I wanted to do the same thing there. Um, while having my last two surgeries that year. And then right after I healed from my hopefully final <laughs> surgery, I pretty much went straight into working at back nine. Okay. So you're, you're still have this end in mind and is it the mm -hmm. record business is the end in mind? Yeah. Yeah. The, that would be just awesome. <laughs> okay. And so you haven't, you don't let go of the dream. Mm -hmm. You clarify the path to the dream. So you want to be CEO of a, of a Fortune 500 company, or in Audra's case, she wants to be in medical device sales and and then may, later on sales management, or in someone mm -hmm. else's case, they want to be in the clothing industry, or they want to be a famous interior designer. The path isn't always ground up. And right. so you realize that. And you figured out, why did you think it was going to be better to come from the side with management and leadership experience and then sales experience? And now at Back Nine, entertainment and entertainment sales experience, um, in which I believe what you're doing is you're kind of that enterprise level, corporate level sales, booking events, creating events for them. You have standard stuff. They customize it. You guys have DJs and music and concerts. And then, by the way, you also have the golf. Yes. Why did it seem to you that going that sideways route was probably a better route than sweeping the floors at Conrad Studios in LA. Yeah, yeah. Well, apart from that, sounding like that would be terrible. Um, sweeping floors all the time. Have to break break out my old shop back from my college work days. Um, yeah. But I think lateral movement is something that people don't see as being a very strategic move. Um, you know, you always hear about climbing up the corporate ladder. Which works. I mean, that that worked in my dad's life, for example. He started at the very bottom and worked his way up. In the um, same company? A, for 25 years, yeah. I, see, um, I never hear of that. I only hear that, of lateral. You know, and, and I don't, that doesn't appeal to me very much. I don't know. Um, I think that having, you know, a, a job and maybe not the exact same industry, but where your skills and your accomplishments are at least applicable to the job that you want in the future um, showing that you've genuinely done that at that same level and then being able to move laterally into the industry that you're looking for, that makes total logical sense to me. Um, and being where I am right now in Indiana, wouldn't call it the music center of the world, and that's okay, but I do like it here. And I have found, you know, an entertainment position that I think is, I'm learning a ton. I've This is the first time I've ever worked in the entertainment industry so being able to show that I can learn and flourish in this industry, regardless of what it actually, the business is, means that I'll be able to, to move laterally when I'm ready. So you say that, you said, and I'll quote you, people don't see lateral movement as strategic. Mm -hmm. And I think those people might have been your peers <laughs> and they don't know what they were talking about. Probably. Could that be? That's, and, you know, most most peers, I think, especially at my age, um, typically don't always know what they're talking yeah, about, yeah. about a lot of topics. <laughs> yeah. And, and, and I think the school should do a better job and they should have a class and they should give everybody a disc test and then talk mm. about the careers that apply and spend some time and a whole semester on understanding paths. And that's why we do this podcast, by the way, yeah. because they don't. That's why. And there's episode number four is about the disc test because they don't. and you know, the most logical path for me is diversity. And mm -hmm. if I have a business, I want a diversity of knowledge and a diversity of experience and a diversity of methods. So if I bring someone that was doing corporate sales in an entertainment facility and putting together different ways to lure in these big customers and different ways to serve these big customers and different ways to create a wonderful experience for these big customers, that's what I would want more than someone that has just been in my own business 
And I and I'm not no. I mean, you know, I love your parents. You know yeah. that I respect yeah. them, and I've heard nothing about good things. But that way isn't as typical anymore. I think nowadays more people in business or in different functions are looking for this diversity of knowledge. And I bet you nowadays your dad would have moved laterally because someone would have plucked him. They would have wanted mm -hmm. whatever he had in the company that they didn't have, just like someone's going to try to pluck you because they want that divergent knowledge from all these different places. Yeah. So you, you well, tell us what you do. So someone that wants to go in the music business might not think, uh, I should try the entertainment business and become really good at sales so I can later sell records. I should try yeah. managing a stupid painting company um, so I can get really good at managing people and serving customers. And then maybe even manage those managers, which you did because you were a manager and a district manager. Yeah. Uh, and really cement. And I tell my son, suck the knowledge out of those companies so you can take it elsewhere. So how did you, how did you, decide that one you were moving to indianapolis and two now was the time to do entertainment instead of i'm sure many offers you had with your resume <laughs> yeah which the the whole process of deciding on a job post-graduation was tedious and rather grueling i will say um so shout out to everybody that's going through that process right now just stick through it you'll find something that's how long did eventually. it take um, it took me about three months, which I know is not very long um, for a lot of people. So I have a lot of respect for for folks that have to deal with it longer. How many than applications? That. Um, I believe I applied to maybe forty jobs for zero. So that takes nowadays you have to retype your whole resume a million times and cover letters and it's a whole process. And you're lucky that's that eighty you hours. Even get an interview. Eighty oh. hours to apply to forty jobs, I would say, plus another oh, yeah, eighty hours of research on what jobs to apply to. Yeah, at, at least. I mean, that felt like my full-time job while I wasn't working. <laughs> it is your full-time so, job. So yeah, I, I do want to pause at that because coincidentally, and we're recording this on May 1st or April 1st. This mm -hmm. isn't coming out for a while. The week of May 1st, um, there's an episode coming out on the job search that I did. And, oh, cool. and I tell people it's going to take six months. And that that's plus or minus. So mm -hmm. I, again, my goddaughter, who, who's a wonderful, angelic human being, I said to her, look, it's going to take you six months. It's going to take my son, Jake, six months. It took her sister nine months. Her sister sent out 100 resumes just to learn how to do interviews. Grace already knows how to do interviews. She right. was the conductor <laughs> of interviews. So she doesn't need that learning curve. Uh, so if you're thinking, if you're looking for a job and you're listening to what Grace is saying, usually where people miss is they're going to apply to a job. They have these three jobs they know about. They're going to apply and get one. No, it's a hundred hours of researching what type of job you want. You don't just decide to go work at back nine out of the blue. It doesn't I mean you want to go in the music business. you got to think long and hard about what my path is and do a hundred hours of research. And then there's finding the companies you want to apply to. And then there's the two hours per job, an hour to research the company, a ha half hour to write your cover letter and a half hour to figure out who to send it to. And then there's <laughs> the interviews. And we have a whole episode that came out sometime at sometime around episode 126, we'll say. That tells you about the job process. I didn't, I don't know if I talked to you too much about it, but you had to spend, even with your resume, uh, doing all sorts of stuff and then being one of the top producers ever in college works as a manager, one of the top producers as a district manager, getting a ton of training from us and a ton of one-on-one -on -one training and coaching and shadowing that you don't get in other companies. And then you still had to spend three months. And if you didn't have that experience, you might you probably would have had to go get another job before you got into your current job because they weren't yeah. hiring entry level. They're hiring mm -hmm. someone with experience, right? So, and that's right. kind of, that's interesting because your path is just like, keep getting more experience here. They get more experience here and they get more experience here, but none of it has been in the end goal. So how far away do you think you are from the end goal now? Yeah, I, I don't think very far, which is very exciting. Um, Cause when I first entered this job, um, it was, it's a new company. They've only been around for about two years. So I knew I was kind of entering into a startup type situation. Um, which is exciting because that is kind of what I felt comfortable with. I mean, college works 
I basically started my own branch. So it didn't scare me. Um, it was exciting. And I had the opportunity to kind of revamp the sales office a little bit and adjust some of the procedures that we do with our clients. And I found that to be super duper valuable. And we've kind of gauged our clients' interest more towards the entertainment and less towards the golf, which just so happens to kind of coincide with my goals, which is really awesome. Um, but I think it's been benefiting the company as as a whole, because um, that is really where we can kind of differentiate ourselves from from the competition and and create a name for ourselves in Indianapolis as well, become kind of a staple there for, for guest entertainment. So um, I definitely wouldn't have expected myself to be working at Back Nine if you would ask me back in college, like, hey, there's this Back Nine place. Do you think you'd work there? I'd be like, no, what are you talking about? Um, but but it, it really has been beneficial. And, and I will say that this type of sales, so at College Works, you're selling, you know, you are selling a service. You are selling something that is needed by your clients. They have to paint their house. That is something that whether they like it or not, or want to spend the money on it or not, it is something that is necessary to keep up your home versus what I'm doing now. It's just fun. I'm just selling fun and entertainment and events. They are the opposite of necessary. So it is a totally different type of selling. And I won't say it's necessarily harder or easier because um, people like being sold fun. So it's kind of easier in that aspect, um, but it's harder to get the money from them. Um, so that's been a learning curve as well. And that's how the music industry is. You know, it's not a necessity. It's rather cutthroat because it is purely entertainment for folks. So that's been super valuable, just learning the different types of selling different products and different services. You know, a lot of the folks in the office who, mind you, are all at least, you know, 15, 20 years older than I am, um, their experience had been in product selling, which is a completely different type of sales. So it's been really interesting to learn how each industry approaches sales and how they can be continued, you know, continuously developed and, and improved as well. And I think that that's really put me on the fast track towards the music industry more than I would have expected even when I first started at the job. So just to back up a little bit on your lateral movement, you mm -hmm. said you came in and you looked at the sales process and you helped adjust the sales process mm -hmm. and you looked at maybe the strategic focus and helped adjust the strategic focus to make it more uh, about experience, more about the entertainment and the experience than, than the golf, or at yeah. least as much about that. And so, and, and then you said you've got, you got, different products that you've sold, different services you've sold, and all these people came from different products. So that is that diversity we were talking about. That is mm -hmm. the lateral movement. You don't get that if you don't get someone from outside. And, and right. if you're listening right now, if you go work in these other companies, if they have good training programs, the next, and, and I'm all for Grace staying with Back Nine Forever. <laughs> and we don't know what Grace's path is. So we don't know. I have a feeling that the back nine people will probably be expanding and they'll probably be starting up new division, a new store, a new division, a new area, regional manual manager, general manager, national manager, president, CEO. There's going to be that path for grace, maybe partner, maybe in charge of franchise sales, maybe a lead franchisee, maybe lead franchisor. You don't know because <laughs> she's going up that, tree trunk and there's mm -hmm. all these different paths and the, there's still this goal way out in the distance but sometimes the goal shifts laterally the goal may shift laterally uh but you're bringing in this variety of experience so it sounds like you this new startup business is running in the new way where they're just gathering as much as they can to benefit the customer and it does mm -hmm. benefit them to focus on the customer because they get more customers but they're oh, looking for all this variety so why do you think, do you think that there's going to be uh, music productions in Back Nine that lead to you know, a music production arm of Back Nine? Where do you see, how, where's the link to the music coming from this stop along the path? Yeah, very well could be. Um, our expansion plans are are vast and very exciting and happening sooner than, um, than anybody would have expected, which is a really great thing. Um, but yeah, I mean, even... Over the summer, we bring in every Thursday, Friday, Saturday nights, we bring in local bands from Indianapolis and then some larger names from outside of Indianapolis as well. 
and I get to interact with these folks and talk to their managers. And that, I mean, has been an incredible experience. And, you know, they're happy to see me because I helped book them a really cool gig. <laughs> so, so that's been really, really cool. Um, and we're just looking to do more and more and more with that. Um, you know, have larger music venues, have larger, you know, more like dance floor club areas where we can bring in some of those DJs that we really like to host just keep expanding on that, I think is really the goal with some additional locations, um, just to have even more space to expand on the, the, the music part of it. Cause that's what folks like. They As long as it's not country so well. music. As, I am not a country fan. As long as it's not country music, we like it. I like where you're going with the DJs. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Yeah, I believe it or not, I'm not a country fan. My uh, hobbies might prove otherwise, but I, yeah, I was actually trying country. to take a dig at you and get in a fight with you right there. I thought you were a country fan. Uh, <laughs> I'm from Chicago originally. I'm not a country fan. Uh, okay, okay. Uh, but it's interesting again, and, and, for, and for the people listening, hopefully at 1.5 speed because I sound funny at normal speed, and <laughs> hopefully taking notes so therefore not driving. You're bringing in your diverse diverse experience and creating a diverse outcome for the business. Mm -hmm. You're adding value. You're working hard like you always have. You're spinning all these plates like you always have. And you just never know what doors open. And I was mentioning the door of back nine having multiple locations that you're in charge of, but you came up with a whole different door. And I would argue that we don't even know what the doors are going to be. And I, I saw... Uh, a coaching business become a ski area before like huh. what <laughs> just crazy stuff happens so yeah. maybe i mean maybe back nine becomes a branded concert venue across the country nobody knows because they're just mm -hmm. getting started but you're there in the thick of it with your experience making it happen and kind of serendipitously winning right yeah, yeah, it's it's been really exciting. And it's like every week there's, you know, some sort of new development that I get to be a part of formulating. So it's it's really cool to have entered into the business at this time. So I, I like to do this show because people don't know what's out there and they want mm -hmm. to go into real estate. So they want to do flip or flop because they see Christina, who has a horrible <laughs> ad voice. I can't stand when she does that. <laughs> that ad. I always have to turn her ad off. It's like the cars for kids ad. I got to turn it off because she influxes her voice weird, but they want to, they want to be like Christina and they don't know what else is out there or they want to all yeah. be lawyers because they don't know what else is out there. So people talk about sales and there's a lot of people that want to go in sales, but what are they going to sell? Are they going to sell shirts? They don't know what's out there. So what mm -hmm. exactly do you do in this business to business sales environment that you're in? What's a day in the life like? What do you love about it? What are the challenges? Yeah, um, it is very unique. Um, definitely not like any other selling I've ever done. So essentially, most of my sales are actually inbound leads, which makes my life a lot easier. I do do okay. some outside sales calls and whatnot. Um, but it is kind of push to have <laughs> mainly inbound leads means the business is doing well. Um, and essentially, they tell me, you know, hey, here's kind of the the event, this is the vibe of the party that we're looking for, like put some together for me. And that's what I do. I write up contracts, talk some numbers. There's very few details that I try to make the client figure out. My job is essentially to make them have the easiest process of putting together a 500,000 person event, which is difficult. And my job is to make that as easy for them as possible. And and yeah, and, and it's it's really cool that most people are generally just excited about what we can offer. And I think that kind of brings in some upselling that I wouldn't have expected to, to be part of this industry, but it definitely is. So that's a fun skill to, to have as well is, you know, upsell where you can. Um, it's never a bad thing. They can, worst thing is, is that they say no. So, um, so yeah. it's never a bad thing the way you bring it to the table though. You're bringing right. it to the table to help them accomplish their dreams. And sometimes right. if you have a dream, we can add this and it may it may, it may, may cost more, but it's going to make it much better. And I know right. you, you're not the type of person that just upsells for upsell sakes. You're right. coming up with solutions that may or may not work and may or may not cost more. And maybe we lower this one and up this one. So you're, you're, so it sounds like really high level listening skills. It's you need to basically like solving a puzzle, which, which I find very fun. Um, cause you know, sometimes we'll have a client that comes in with a budget that is 
relatively unrealistic in today's day and age, but we make it work. We try to see what we can do to, to put on an event for them, regardless of their budget. Um, or if they have an unlimited budget, I'm like, let me tell you about all the fun things we can add. Um, and they love it. So so it's, it's very, very, um, you know, just fun, you know, um, and, and especially just the problem solving aspect of it. And yes, high level listening, high level communication skills, especially with a venue that is as big as ours, our building is absolutely huge. A lot of my clients have never actually been to the building before, but they're looking to host an event there. So I have to properly communicate, you know, hey, here's the setup, here's the floor plan, like all of these back and forth transactions of they've never been to this venue before, but they're giving me thousands of dollars to host an event here. I, I better make sure I communicate what the event is going to look like before it happens. So how does one listening right now develop the listening skills, the ability to figure out what the problem is through communication skills, and then the problem solving skills in a way that makes people feel good about spending more money or not spending more money, depending on their decision. How, how, do, how do, would one get those skills to apply to whatever industry they want to be in? They want to be in the golf industry, or they want to be in the entertainment industry, or they want to be in the medical sales industry. How would you do that? Yeah, it really all comes down to just experience. And I would say any experience that has anything to do with customer service or, um, you know, sales, which is just essentially an elevated version of customer service in my book. <laughs> it's not something that you can learn from a class. You know, I, I took sales classes in college and they were great, you know, learning different different tactics and whatnot. Um, psychology mainly is what most sales classes are which are all really great, um, but you don't genuinely get to practice those listening and communication, professional communication skills unless you just go out and practice them. Even if that means running your own lawn business for a summer, like go talk to people on the street, listen to their problems, see if you can offer a solution. It's, it's just practice out in the real world. That's kind of the only way that you can really get that good at it. And you kept adjusting up. So you had your various jobs where you had customer interaction, then you did the mm -hmm. college works manager thing, then you did the college works DM thing, then you did the corporate sales thing. You're not mm -hmm. getting stuck in this. You have to have ambition. Where's your Where's your definition of excellence here in my notes? Doing something you're passionate about that also benefits others. And once you're excellent at that, which you were excellent here at college works, you apply that excellent elsewhere and you keep kind of stepping up and stepping up. So you can't be apathetic. You can't be lethargic. You can't be slovenly. Um, you have to be hard charging, making it happen and just sucking up all the experience you can get. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, and it's, it's out there. Like if you can't find it, then go make it for yourself. I mean, essentially that's what the college works internships helps you do is they help you just make it for yourself. You make your business what you want it to be. You book the clients that you want to book. Like that is what was so beneficial about it is, you know, you had so much freedom to run your business the way that you wanted to with the guidance of people that had done it a whole bunch of times. Um, so yeah, if, if you don't think that that experience is somewhere reachable for you, one, I'd probably say that you're wrong, but two, then go make it for yourself. Go make your own experience. And you know what else you 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 don't book the clients you want to, whether it's at College <laughs> yeah. Works, yeah, whether it's at College Works back nine, Microsoft. So you you have to get used to picking yourself up, dusting yourself off, and moving on. And I'm just paying attention to the clock here. You had to pick yourself up and dust yourself off and move on many, many times, sometimes from these major physical issues with your hips. Yeah. When you look back at that, and you're still very, very young. What was the toughest challenge and what was one of the best things that came out of your toughest challenge? Oh boy. Um, yeah, I mean, I would say it's it's inadvertently the the hip surgeries. Um, I I would say in college, you know, I wanted to do all these million things and, and I did for for many of those years. But knowing that right post grad, I would have to have, so I graduated in May, I had surgery that very next month. So I knew that I couldn't start my job search until after surgery. I couldn't start my job search the beginning of my senior year, like all of my other colleagues. That Bullshit. Was really no one, well. they all should start at the beginning of the senior year. A lot of Not them wait. You can't start working until almost the following year. Yeah. But, you got to um, put your nine months in. 
You weren't able yeah. to put your nine months in when you wanted to. Correct. Uh, I did, you know, I was looking and whatnot, but not applying. And, and that was tough for a person like me who had been working almost full time since they were like 16 and had always had a bunch of things going on. So it was quite the mental struggle, I would say, more than even just the physical recovery of the surgeries. It was definitely more mental, knowing that I kind of had to put my professional career on pause for just a moment. It felt like eternity, but it was really only a couple of months um, just to get all that stuff sorted out. And I do think that I learned a lot about myself in that time. I had never just paused. I mean, since I started working at 16, I had never just had a moment to pause. Um, so I do think I had a lot of self-reflection in that and, and knew that the path I wanted to take, I had to have a better work-life balance than maybe I did in college. I had to put more emphasis on my physical well-being. Um, and I think that that is something a lot of college students don't have the opportunity to do because college is a wild time. And most people are not taking into account their work-school life balance. And so I, I do think that I benefited from that period, even though it really sucked at the time, because um, I just wanted to work and just get going with my professional career. It, it taught me that things happen for a reason. Things work out the way that they should. I ended up in a position that I love and that I never would have expected, but I would say is very perfect for me at this time in my life. And everything just kind of pans out the way that it's supposed to. So. I don't know where the hell, I, I don't know what they're doing in Indiana, what they're putting in the water, but your understanding of, the normal college student is totally different than mine. <laughs> so when you're when you're talking about the normal college student and this crazy life they're having, is there there? I think their balance is the wrong way. Like they have yeah. nothing but fun and nothing but partying, and maybe they study a little. Which bit isn't they, good either. Which isn't know? good either. So yeah. <laughs> so maybe you were. <laughs> yeah, you were a little over on the work side, but most mm -hmm. of you listening right now, if you're in college, are under on the work side. Not like she was. Okay, but you you learned you needed you learned a little bit about yourself. You learned about reflection and clear. You were able to clarify. You learned to take time. I just recently learned how to relax too. It's I said hard. I don't know how to relax, and then I it's blew my hard. back out at Christmas, and I was forced to lay on my back and read books. Mm -hmm. And now I'm like relaxing, like I I could never sit still. I can't watch a movie. I'm just buzzing around cleaning the house. I just can't stop. And my wife's like, "You're gonna die of a heart attack." So. I had to learn how to relax. So the toughest challenge, which you you were never grumpy about, you were never poor me, victimized sounding. You just had a challenge you had to get through. And I think at the time you might have looked at it as a learning experience before it happened, but definitely now afterwards, it was a learning experience. Yeah, certainly. And it, it has been funny, you know, speaking to some of my old college colleagues and and they see me now. I just have a you know a normal job where, you know, granted, I probably work a couple extra hours here and there, work a little harder, you know, than your average person, but it is just a normal job with a normal life. And they're like, wow, you seem so much different. I'm like, you know, it's a good thing to feel like you are in tune with your work. You're in tune with your life. You, you found a good fit. Um, that's really important. And it's fun to see other people notice that. <laughs> yeah, and you're still crushing it and you're still working way harder than normal. You, you and I don't understand normal, can't help right? It. <laughs> yeah, we don't understand. So let me ask you, and this is kind of a side note. Uh, we'll take a little divergence here. Did you have any depression when you were going through that? It's tough. Um, definitely. Especially just when you're sedentary as well. I mean, I'm a very active person. Hence, you know, I used to play basketball. I ride horses now as my choice of sport, um, just because it's actually better on your hips, believe it or not. Um, but I Wouldn't wasn't able, I know it's, it's strength in some, it's less okay. contact, okay. Um, which is good. But I, I wasn't able to do any of that for six months. I mean, I was in a wheelchair and then on crutches for months and months and months. It sucked. Um, and it, it, it stinks to be a very independent and self-sufficient person. And then all of a sudden I'm like, I can't even do stairs. <laughs> and how, did you, how did you get through the mental challenges? Uh, really um, just surrounding myself with really supportive people um, who had been with me for multiple surgeries at this point. So they were kind of, you know, they, they knew the drill, which was good. It, it stunk at being, you know, the third and fourth time that I'm going through this. It almost felt like it got harder. Because the first two, I was like, that's okay, I can get through these. And then these other ones, I'm like, oh my gosh, like when is this going to end? Um, so I think, you know, surrounding yourself with with people that have your best interest in mind and, and know you really well and are willing to encourage you in, in the darkest times 
Um, that's really, really important. And then also just keeping up with doing tiny little things that you still can do. So for me, it was, I was able to wheel myself over to the piano and play piano when, when I could, when I felt up to it. Um, I think stuff like that really made a huge difference. So no, I couldn't go and shoot hoops, but I could go play some piano and, and do the little things that brought me some, some joy through the non-walking periods of my life. Okay. Yeah. It reminds me of the, the Alcoholics Anonymous uh, adage of one day at a time. Mm -hmm. You looking for those little wins. So you can't do what you want, but you're not going to sit there and get upset about it. You're going to search right. for something you can do and find a little win. You surround yourself with positive people. You didn't have to get to the point where you needed therapy or medical assistance. No, you were able yeah. to manage it yourself, which I, mm -hmm. and if you're listening right now, Grace and I, that that's who we are. That's the genes we were given. <laughs> that's the, the, something, somehow we got lucky. Not everyone's able to do that. So if you need help, um, there's people out there. If you work at College Works, I don't know if you know this, but I hired a psychologist mm. on staff at College Works. Well, she's on retainer. So it used to be That's me, awesome. everybody would call. And now we have <laughs> yeah. her um, for free That's to good. our employees. And she works wonders because not everybody can muscle through it the way you and I do. We're lucky. My wife can't. Yeah, it, it's tough. I'm I'm super happy to hear that. And anybody that's out there that is part of the internship doing it right now or is thinking about it or is in, you know, a, a tough learning position similar to college where take advantage of stuff like that because it there's no shame in it um at all. It's for your own for your own benefit. So take advantage of it. That that stuff's really important. And anybody that's going through a tough challenge, there's an opportunity to learn about yourself. There's yeah. opportunity for reflection, clarification. There's solutions in some of the people around you. And if you've got the wrong people around you, fire them as friends. If your parents <laughs> yeah. aren't supportive, take a break from talking to them and talk to someone else's parents. Mm -hmm. um, and then I love the idea of looking for little wins. What can yeah. you do? What is What can you do today that you couldn't do yesterday? What can you do better today that you um, did yesterday? What are the little wins you can find that perk you up? And then I think you you always, I, mean, I remember when you went to your second surgery, you had like a timeline for it. And, and mm -hmm. you set that up so you have something to look forward to, right? Yeah, yeah, definitely. Having it literally written out on my paper calendar, like, hey, this is the day I'm off crutches. What are we going to do that day to celebrate? Even if it's just going for a walk with my dog, you know, um, it's, it's, it's setting yourself up for success by, by, yeah, having some structure to recovery in any way, whether that's a physical recovery or a mental recovery. And you don't, you know, don't be hard on yourself if you don't hit those deadlines. I did have one surgery where I was supposed to be off crutches and I had to be on for two more weeks and yeah, that reset sucked. the deadline, you know? but, but Hey, I just had another, another date to look forward to. And that's kind of how you have to look at it. Yeah. Well, I'll ask you one more question, then we'll let you go. I know I'm running over time. When you look back at the sacrifices you made and you haven't been around that long, but you made some sacrifices that at the time were like, I can't believe I'm missing this party or missing this trip or whatever <laughs> it was. What was the sacrifice you made in your earlier years that you look back and you're like, thank God I made that? Yeah, I would say in college, you know, just the experience you think you want, um, you know, whether that's with friends or parties or, you know, just all the stuff, you know, you find time for the stuff that you need. So when I was in college works, I'm like, oh my gosh, I just need a Friday night. Like I would just go take it. That's okay. But it wasn't every single night because that's not what I needed. So at, at the time, you know, I felt like, oh my gosh, I'm going to be missing out on all this stuff. And some of my friends that at the time, you know, they had never had a job before. They were flunking out of classes. They were just kind of in a different mindset as I was in college. You know, they didn't get it. They did not understand college work. They thought I was a crazy person for working that many hours and they wouldn't understand. And looking back on that now, um, I'm not surprised that they didn't understand and, you know, it, during that time that sucked, I was like, oh my gosh, I'm losing all these friends because I'm doing, you know, this super hard internship, but those weren't friends worth having. They weren't gonna, you know, help me succeed in my life moving forward. So if they couldn't take any encouragement from me, then that's their loss. But I think all of those, um, you know, fleeting pleasures in, in college, you will have what you need. If you yeah, need a day yeah. just to relax, take it. Like you just don't need it every day. Like a lot of college kids that you see. So I don't regret 
absolutely anything. Um, I think that it all, the benefits greatly outweigh anything that I had to give up. Um, no, I did not have a normal college career, but that's okay. I'm pretty happy with where it got me now. So <laughs> yeah, normal equals normal. So if mm -hmm. you have a normal college career, you're probably going to have a normal experience after college and normal is average. If you want an extraordinary experience after college, you need to find an extraordinary college life experience, which you did. Yeah. And it yeah. involves oh, spinning all the plates. <laughs> yeah. Well, well, Grace, thank you so much for going overtime and making time to yeah. share your cool, wild story on your path to your goals. Thank you for coming on the Edge of Excellence. Thank you so much for having me, Matt. It was, it was so nice to chat with you again. It always is a pleasure to talk to you. <laughs>